My name is Florian, um, and today Sina and I we will um, talk to you about audience perceptions of data journalism and what readers like or rather do not like about data driven stories. Um, so over the past year um, or the past years, we could see an increase of articles that draw numbers and statistics. Um, and because there is lots of data and statistics, there is also lots of potential for data driven reporting. Um, as data journalists are the ones who um, are the most likely to work with such uh, quantitative information. Um, and of course, at times when society's health and welfare depend in part on news consumers engaging with understanding and acting on numbers in the news, it is important that we can better understand and also respond to uh, people's perceptions and preferences um, for a journalism that communicates uh, uh, those numbers and statistics. But so far, um, we have very little understanding of that. Um, so we need to involve the readers in the process of, of curating and presenting numbers and texts. Um, now, numbers and statistics in news articles are primarily found in what we might call uh, quantitative journalism. So just to briefly add some theoretical grounding to this, um, through the lens of journalism studies, we consider data journalism a specific and highly professionalized branch of uh, quantitative journalism. And quantitative journalism, in turn, is considered a journalistic subfield that comprises various approaches um, um, of journalists dealing with data, numbers, and statistics. So the bottom line is that in quantitative journalism, journalism uh, uh, journalists rely on data sources and present data and statistics as objects of evidence to support and legitimize their claims. Um, Nowadays, computer assisted reporting, data journalism, and computational journalism, which includes variations of automated journalism, um, are the most prominent variants of this journalistic strand. Um, the three of them vary in terms of their uh, dependence on technology, how elemental quantitative information is to them, um, and how much actual computation is involved. Um, and these three variants were born out of the same ideas um, and are not. And, and, and not only genealogically, but they're closely related concepts, um, and there are certainly some overlapping notions behind these concepts. Now, in the, over the past decades, we could see that the automation and also the quantification um, within news um, um, are accelerating. And of course, this goes um, hand in hand with some uh, challenges. Um, now, something that has become very familiar over the past few years is uh, that there is an increasing amount of data and statistics in journalistic articles, changing the overall appearance of news articles. And as to the consequences of automation of news production, we have to assume that some journalistic elements, such as description or background information, anecdotes or analysis, um, appear to limit the scope um, of automation. Um, and at the same time, journalists who write for uh, who write templates for a template-driven automated news production need to incorporate um, computational thinking, and they need to adapt to the combinatorics of, of a parameterized story template. And for these reasons, we reckon that the quantification and automation um, certainly affect data-driven news work and data-driven articles. Um, and as we want to understand how audiences react to this kind of journalism, we need to develop and deploy um, um, instruments to measure audience perceptions of such news texts. And to do so, various dimensions and criteria have been used in the past, for example, how respondents perceive the quality or the credibility of an article. Um, most of these dimensions and measures um, stem from academic theorizations and also professional ideals of news work. But still, there is very little consensus about uh, which items and scales should be used and whether these items and scales apply to different forms of journalism and can actually capture the characteristics of different journalistic formats. So this is where we want to join in on this discussion, um, as none of these criteria have been developed specifically for data journalism or uh, other forms of data-driven journalism, such as automated journalism. So none of these criteria have been developed for quantitative journalism and data in journalism. Now, to understand how news texts are affected by automation and data, um, we uh, should have a look at, at the, the workflows of automated news production um, and data-driven journalism in general. So this is uh, exemplified by RADAR, which stands for Reporters and Data and, and Robots. Um, they call themselves the world's only automated news agency, and they're part um, um, of uh, PA Media. 
And as most of you probably know, data-driven investigations usually start with the publication of a data set. Um, so the starting point is one or more data sources. And journalists and organizations then tap such data sources and select data sets they find newsworthy. Such a data set is then broken down into a story, either uh, through more traditional workflows, um, when a human journalist edits a data-driven story, and this procedure will be more closely related to computer-assisted reporting or data journalism with not much computation involved. Um, or news organizations deploy data-driven templates um, in order to automate uh, the production of these data-driven news articles. This is particularly the case when organizations work with uh, data sets that are released on a regular basis or when organizations um, take national or even global data sets and they want to automate the production of articles tailored to specific audiences so in order to scale the content production. And on top of that, there can also be hybrid stories. Um, these are uh, developed directly from the particular automated article, but then subsequent, subsequently altered and or extended uh, by journalists, for example, by adding quotes from local spokespeople or by cutting content um, that was not considered relevant uh, for the target audience. Um, and there are certainly also other workflows in, in data-driven quantitative journalism, but these appear to be the most prevalent ones. And also most of the stories that we sampled uh, for this study um, were based on these workflows. So in practice, it can look like this. Uh, to the left, you can see a human authored story published by the CNN. And we have highlighted some of the central aspects of these stories, um, which include certain story angles, uh, quotes from data providers or spokespersons, uh, referrals to data sources, and of course, lots of numbers. Um, in the middle, you can see uh, an automated story, in this instance, produced by Radar. Uh, to the right, you can see how this story then appears in an online local news outlet, the New and Recorder, um, where reporters choose to either publish the stories um, as they are or uh, without making changes or by editing them after the automated production. And as we can see, the automation and quantification uh, uh, affect automated news texts, and the quantification obviously also affects human authored news texts. Um, so these human authored articles exhibit the, kind of the same characteristics as the automated stories, but to a different extent. So human articles, human data driven articles might not be as number heavy um, or use the same angle um, as the automated counterparts. Um, now, as I mentioned in the beginning, we want to understand how audiences react to these kinds of news stories and not only how they react, but what criteria they the readers would come up with um, and the criteria that they would use to evaluate the stories. Um, so the study aims to collect and analyze audience perceptions of and preferences for data-driven news texts that span a range of topics, used different combinations of sources, and were produced using varying degrees of automation, including none. So our two research questions are what criteria the audiences use to evaluate data-driven news, and based on those criteria, what direction are their preferences expressed? So to answer these questions, we expose news consumers to data-driven news stories. Overall, we compiled 21 sets of articles. Um, so that was 48 articles overall that are identical in terms of topic, subject, and use data sources. We found these stories by monitoring the radar output search for automated stories published by the, uh, the BBC and CNN. We identified articles published in local news organizations um, that were edited versions um, of some of this uh, untouched radar output. Um, and we were looking for human authored data driven articles that used the same data sources and were published around the same time as the automated and post edited, the hybrid versions. Um, we then took those articles and stripped them of all confounding variables that, in, that we know from previous research that would have an effect on readers' perceptions. So we created plain HTML files, just kept basic formatting to ensure readability. Um, and we excluded any information that would disclose how and by whom these articles were produced or published. And most importantly, at no time did we disclose the degree of automation to the participants to avoid them discriminating the articles based on their expectations of data journalism or automated news. All right, so uh, I would take over from here. I hope you can all hear me fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so what did we do then? We took uh, the article sets and showed them to 31 interviewees that we grouped according to their residence in the UK so that 
the locally specific articles would also match the region and just naturally be a bit more relevant to them. Uh, in the case of two topic specific groups, we grouped them according to their preference for either football or finance news. So there was no local specification there. Um, and in the interviews, we started with free discussion about the uh, stimuli text and followed that free discussion up with some semi-structured interview questions. Um, this is what we did for the data generation. So to the right, you can see a list that we ended up with, a list of codes. Um, after the interviews, we had transcripts of around 116,000 words. Um, and added around 2,400 codes to these transcripts. So we procedurally developed those code labels using triple coding and group deliberation amongst the three of us, so Neil, Florian, and I. Um, and then we reduced those findings down to the final set of codes and dimensions. Uh, so let's just have a quick look at those findings. Uh, what you see here are the criteria and dimensions that our participants themselves brought up uh, in their evaluation of the data-driven news text that we showed them. So what we will show you now is just a small insight, just a taste, if you, if you can say so. Um, these findings are not re representative, but we will put out a quantitative online survey with roughly 4,000 people later this year uh, in which we want to put those findings to the test. Um, the analysis yielded 28 perception criteria, um, as you see here in the table, and various dimensions thereof, uh, which we grouped into four categories. So what you see here um, in the headline of the table are those categories. To the very left, you have the antecedents of perception, which describe the predispos predisposition sorry, that the readers bring uh, with them even before starting the reception process. So uh, their general affinity for numbers and statistics, for instance, um, and those criteria are situated on the audience side. So this means they don't uh, have to do anything with the articles per se. However, they do affect uh, how they the, per, the audience encounter the articles. Uh, afterwards, you see, or uh, uh, next to, to the predispositions, you see um, article-specific categories. Um, and in between the article specific categories, the predisposition are the criteria of emotional and cognitive impact. Uh, we use those to capture the effects of the articles on the readers. Then we come to article composition, which comprises criteria that the participants use to evaluate the article more on a formal and stylistic level. Uh, this category also offers a criterion with several dimensions to capture various aspects of linguistic features, which we will go into detail in a minute. Um, and the final category to the very right side of the table is uh, what we termed um, news and editorial values. So this is what audiences use in order to evaluate specific journalistic traits that are reflected in the article. Uh, you can see that we could identify plenty criteria. Um, and I want to emphasize at this point that all those, so this whole catalog, if you can say so, uh, is the output of the interviews. So we did not come uh, with any predefined criteria to the interviewing situation. Uh, we did not replicate on purpose any pre-existing criteria. However, this is all you know, derived from the interviews. Um, and we will see later, it does reflect some findings that we already know. However, we could also add new information. Uh, I'm not going into detail uh, in, on all of them, of course, but uh, I would like to present some criteria that we picked out that we think might be particularly interesting for you as an audience today and for the context of this conference. Um, and just as a warning, uh, we will highlight some of the more critical remarks uh, that the participants had just because we think it's more constructive and maybe more interesting to show you uh, what might not be working yet as well uh, in the context of data-driven journalism for the audience. Um, and then just to show you what might not cause any problems at all. So let's just uh, jump right into it. Um, first of all, we would like to present um, the uh, category uh, participants comprehension of numbers. So from the articles that we showed them and from their reactions, we could see that uh, the articles for the audience oftentimes 
contained too many numbers and were overly statistical, which made it harder for lay people, so people who are not really often confronted with numbers as much, um, to understand what they actually meant. Um, and uh, the articles also used numbers in formats that were not really um, liked by the participants. So for instance, um, or generally speaking, articles that offered numbered in a, numbers in a more reserved manner, so that didn't feature as many numbers, were described as more accessible by the audiences. Um, and furthermore, um, numbers shown in a different way, so transliterated or in the context of analogies, were also um, perceived as more like or were more liked or perceived as more easy to read. So for instance, the question of whether numbers should be rounded or not um, was also part of their comprehensibility. So people seem to have preferred rounded numbers over um, exact data. Uh, the participants appeared to prefer analogies, for instance, by comparing certain amount of hectares with a football field, which would make it a bit more easier to grasp and understand the dimension of the numbers, so what they re expressed in, in real life. Um, and also participants would often prefer ratios instead of parts per thousands or parts per hundreds. When we move on to the article's composition, um, we see that regarding the overall linguistic features, participants felt uh, that some articles were not really well written and resembled reports rather than journalistic articles. Um, so they mentioned that some articles read just as an like an assembly of bullet points or a list of facts rather than you know a well written cohesive journalistic article. Um, they would of course appreciate it when there was some narrative flow when they felt that the facts in the articles so the data um, were tied together and that would add you know to the coherence. In general, participants across the board seem to like. A descriptive and immersive language uh, in the writing of, of the data-driven articles. And um, the participants also spoke about some articles featuring overly technical language or problematic words that might be characteristic of data-driven reporting, such as the word median or other, you know, data-specific uh, vocabulary. Um, the final category that we already mentioned before comprises criteria that were used to evaluate certain news va values and editorial values. So what the audiences or the readers could extract from the articles as those values. Um, so specific features of the journalistic craft that is our, or that would be reflected in the articles. Uh, what we wanted to highlight here at this point is uh, what we termed the presence of human angle, which could appear diametrical to statistic heavy, statistics heavy reporting or data driven news texts. So what we mean by this is that although a lot of the audiences or the readers did welcome statistics and reporting for several reasons, they also often wanted it to be accompanied by human anecdotes, um, such as interviews or vox pops, because those elements would give a voice to the data, so to the facts, and make it a bit more relatable and real. And in fact, uh, we can see that in most articles um, uh, that are rated quite negatively, it is often in terms of a lack of a human angle. Um, our participants also pointed out that they were missing a human element in many stories that did not feature protagonists. Um, because those protagonists would have given the voice, it wouldn't would have given the article a voice um, uh, and would have accompanied the facts very well. Uh, well, some participants acknowledged that a human angle might not be suitable for those kinds of data driven stories. Uh, overall, we would take away and we would understand that uh, the participants from our focus groups um, actually tended to see this type of personalization as an important element for reading pleasure and um, also for comprehension. The last criterion that we would like to present uh, is the degree to which participants felt that the articles provided analysis of the numbers and facts given as well as offering solutions in the sense of constructive journalism, which is probably a term you're all familiar with. Um, most participants actually wanted the articles to explain why facts were as they were, um, and how the numbers came about. Um, most articles, however, did not feature such elements and then would be actually criticized for lacking context, analysis, uh, and interpretation. 
Um, and people appeared to be often looking for solutions in news articles. So they wanted the articles to not only state the facts, but they also wanted them to offer guidance and an outlook about how specific issues that were transported in the data could then be resolved. So this was a you know, journalistic uh, task that they would, were then often missing. Okay, so what can we essentially take away from our findings? Um, overall, from this whole study, we really can see that readers can help us identify ways how to better communicate data and how to more efficiently communicate data in journalism. Um, that was possible due to the bottom-up approach that we chose, and therefore we could understand what criteria readers themselves actually use and come up with to evaluate data-driven journalism. Once again, I emphasize that we did not bring any criteria to the interviews. We derived all of them from the audiences and then just arranged them in a way that made sense to us. Um, some of those criteria that we ended up with actually add depth to the existing criteria from the literature that Florian mentioned earlier, uh, while others are new and specifically for data-driven news text develop criteria that can you know, enrich our discussion um, on this issue. For instance, the comprehension of numbers, uh, some of the linguistic features that we just that I just uh, talked about, um, the presence of a human angle, uh, or analysis and interventionism in this specific context of data-driven journalism. As our results show, we can see that these criteria are indeed suitable for capturing the specifics of data-driven journalism because we added those specific new criteria to the conversation. And we think that those criteria which we grouped under news and editorial values specifically are helpful when we want to explore the effects of quantification of news text and journalists approach to data driven routines. So we specifically hope to also bring some interesting information to the practitioner side of things uh, to offer some guidance with this study or some inspiration for practitioners, journalists specifically who work with data a lot. Uh, on how to better and more efficiently communicate that data to their audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Jerome from um, Uni University of Sheffield. So today I'm going to talk about UK audiences' perceptions of COVID-19 data visualization. Uh, next slide, please. So data visualizations uh, played quite a prominent role in the news coverage about COVID-19 during pandemic. And uh, data visualization also usually we sort it as a kind of effective way of presenting COVID data to audience in order to engage them and to explain re relevant issues to them, so make them understand uh, these issues. However, is this really the case? So during pandemic, what uh, I was wondering are the two questions. How do audiences read, understand, and trust COVID-19 data visualizations? And what kind of influencing factors there might be there? Um, I usually do you know, journalism studies. However, I wanted to do something about audience perception. Just wanted to find more information about you know, the effect of, of journalistic work. So, therefore, I interviewed 18 UK audience members about how they see data visualizations. I selected 11 uh, data visualizations published by legacy news, uh, news media and available on their website. So, I showed them and discussed with them about how they see these data visualizations. Yeah? So, um, this group of audience members uh, they, uh, most of them, they are in their middle age, with 40 plus being the majority, the main group. And they are very uh, well, uh, well educated. Apart from three students, university students, uh, most of them, they are working in a professional field, such as medicine, education, media, the public sector, IT uh, industry. So I would say this group of participants, they are very much, they have quite high levels of data literacy compared to ordinary audience members, especially for those people who work in IT or as a data analyst, their data literacy level even higher than the rest of the group. 
And uh, the, uh, in the interview, we discussed the three aspects of data visualization, likability, uh, learning values, and the trust, trustworthiness. So likability means uh, how much they like it, and whether or not a, a data visualization is likable. And uh, uh, learning values refers to whether or not, and if so, to what extent uh, they can learn something from the data visualization. And the third aspect, uh, trustworthiness, uh, well, has to forward, you know, how much, how, how reliable they think the data visualization is. The interview uh, uh, is a, a semi-structured interview. Uh, the minimum uh, time for each interview, and um, for, for these interviews is one hour. So. It is some interviews even run three hours. So basically, we discussed these data visualizations with them quite in quite in, in, in depth. But today, because of the time limits, so we I can't go to detail. I will address discuss some emerging patterns across these interviews that might be helpful for data journalism practices. So next slide, please. Thank you. So um, the discussion show that this group of, of, uh, of people actually suffer from time poverty and uh, attention scarcity as well as I think you know as us you know. So um, this, uh, the discussion shows the peril of time poverty and uh, uh, attention scarcity and the problems caused by using small screens such as mobile. Um, think about this group of people's background. Apart from these students, you know, most of them, they are, they are professionals. They have professional life and also they have family life needed to maintain. Uh, many of them, they have children, young children. So they juggle professional and uh, family lives. Therefore, they really don't have much time for consuming the news. So um, for them, they are, well, compared to ordinary group of audience members, uh, they are where they are well, they are well off. You know, they have actually they can afford buying news. However, only about uh, one third of them they pay for news. The rest of them they uh, use uh, free news or you know use uh, especially use mobile to access the news feed into them. So for this group of people, they prefer to see a simple, straightforward, quick graph that does not them to put in effort to try to figure out what that mean. Okay, so if they, if I give them a kind of very complicated data visualization, they will say, okay, so if now if you ask me to have a look, I will look. However, in reality, if I see a data visualization like that is so complicated, I would just skip it because I don't have time for it. Yeah. And the fact is that most of them, they use uh, uh, small screens such, such as mobile to consume news uh, does not help at all because uh, reading a very complicated data visualization on mobile is really difficult, yeah? Could you, uh, yes, this slide. Okay, thank you. So for example, this is a quote from one interview. Um, the participant said, if I was reading it on train on my mobile, I probably wouldn't bother to look at it. Because uh, for, for her, you know, she is a professional in her work, she uses a lot of data. However, off work, she just wants to get some information that she needs. So therefore, the first sight of the data visualization is very important because if the first impression, first glance, so won't give them, you know, the being attractive to them, then they would just skip it. So that's like, okay. And uh, this group of uh, audience uh, um, participants, uh, they appear to be critical readers. They like to do these critical readings because, for example, when they read, uh, when they read uh, data visualizations, they, many of them automatically look for numbers on the graph, look for the context of the data, and then look for relevant uh, data sources. So their pre-existing knowledge about uh, domain, about uh, um, data, actually play a really important role here in you know, influencing uh, how they think about the data visualizations. And uh, the discussion also shows uh, data visualizations uh, like ability cannot be identical to learning values and uh, not identical to uh, trustworthiness. So like ability, learning values and trustworthiness, the three things actually do not really associate with each other. That's interesting. 
some data visualizations uh, has really high scores for likability and the learning values, but uh, suffer a lot in, you know, in terms of trustworthiness. But uh, some may have a very high, you know, learning, uh, learning trustability, uh, sorry, trustworthiness, but the uh, learning uh, values might be low. Okay. So um, overall, they like to see either very straightforward, simple graph, or an interactive, um, but and crea very create creative graph. So if a graph is so busy, um, they won't like it, and no, you know, they say I will learn the same thing. So, however, if a graph is too simple, without a number, for example, that won't uh, have any good uh, scores for likability or learning value or trust the words in this exercise. Thank you. So this is, the, this is an example. Um, I believe most of us probably you know, have seen this one because uh, this is uh, quite well known and given the time um, this was published, uh, it is quite inspiring and also important. You know, personally, I think it is very interesting and I saw lots of discussion on the internet among practitioners. And uh, I show this to um, audience participants. To my surprise, uh, most of them, they think it is too simple. Yeah? So although some of them, they acknowledge that this is uh, meaningful and that they um, can see the concept conveyed to them immediately. And some of them, they also acknowledge that this is important. However, most of them, do not rank it high for its likability nor learning value. Um, the reason, there are some reasons for that. One important reason is because there is no number there. Yeah? However, this uh, uh, graph, they rank it quite high for trustworthiness because of um, the news organization, you know, it's a, the economist published, and also because of the data source, as you can see, they trust the both of them. So although their scores for likability and the learning value is really low, but their scores for uh, trustworthiness is really high. So um, right. So if we talk about uh, um, right, uh, if we talk about uh, trustworthiness, you know, lacking of the information about the numbers could affect their um, their scores for likability and the learning value. However, as in this example show us. The reputation of news sources, um, sorry, the reputation of news media and uh, the reputation of the new data source actually could help boost the trust of audience in the, uh, in the data uh, visualization. However, for this graph, this graph was published by the Daily uh, Paragraph, the situation just the opposite. Um, readers rank high, relatively high, for likability and the learning value for this. So this graph was ranked uh, fifth among the 11th data visualization for its uh, likability, fourth among <coughs> 11th of the data visualization for its learning value. However, it is uh, for its trustworthiness, it was in a 10 of 11th. There are several reasons to explain why the audience participants show um, you know, doubt on this graph. Uh, one is because on this x-axis, you can see the use percentage to represent. There isn't a number. So there isn't any information about how many survey they did for this uh, study. And also, you know, um, which, what kind of method they use, all this contextual information, the background information about study is missing there. So therefore, participants question how important this study is. They wanted to know more information about <coughs> it. And another thing, actually, if we look at the category here, male, female is fine, but however, it missed, you know, further possibility, you know, well, if they use the biology, gender to refer male and male and female. So some meaning is in there. And uh, the participants particularly uh, pointed out you know, about uh, the age and, uh, and the geographical uh, category. They use age 16 to 34. The range is quite wide. It could cover several generations. And also they put, for example, Scotland and uh, uh, and uh, in North Island together. So it doesn't really make sense to participants. That's the second reason. 
The third reason is uh, the data source, uh, uh, Savantar. None of the participants, they recognize what that is, what that new source is, uh, despite the fact that some of them work in the IT industry and one of them work as data analysis, but they don't know what that is. So they question, what is this organization? Is this reliable? You know, because of that, I don't trust them. So that is uh, another reason you know, for why this uh, data visualization rank uh, uh, so low for its uh, trustworthiness. However, uh, when audience participants, they read the data visualizations, uh, um, if it uh, comes to data visualization as a multiple dimension and uh, multiple variables, they often come up with different multiple interpretations. For example, in this case, because we can see there is a dimensional gender, age, and uh, geographical locations. So among these, um, among these uh, uh, 18 participants, some of them, they definitely focus on gender difference. Some of them focus on, on age, and some of them focus on geolocation. Uh, uh, and also they link back to their life experience to compare, you know, is this true? You know, when I observe, you know, in the public space, public, you know, all those young people, they violate, uh, you know, kind of uh, guidance or etc. So they use their, they link back to their own personal experience to try to understand the meaning of this data visualization. And um, could you go back to So last point is uh, cannot always get the point, especially for those uh, data visualization, very complicated, very busy with uh, multiple vari uh, variables. And if there isn't any good explanation on the graph, audiences, you know, they even get, uh, they, they, they're very easy for them to get lost, they get confused. They cannot always get the point that a data visualization would like to convey to them. The reason I say, you know, data visualization would like to convey to them because I read the stories about, uh, um, you know, journalists, they wrote there, for example, this data visualization, what they would like to say there. And then I compared this with, uh, you know, the audience's pers pers perspective, um, perception, and I surprisingly find in some cases, actually, some data graph, you know, journalists are very proud of, and as a researcher, probably I found this very interesting. However, audience members, they just don't get the point. The reason, very important reason, is uh, one is busy, the other reason is uh, there aren't any good explanation there. Would you go to the last one? Thank you. So this is uh, an example of that, you know, this uh, uh, data graph published by The Guardian. Um, although some um, participants, they, they admitted to that uh, this uh, gives them some new perspective and very interesting. However, overall, this graph is, uh, was ranked as the least, uh, you know, least, uh, tra uh, least uh, likable, least uh, learning values. Although they trust it because of Guardian and because of the data sources they have seen that before. However, they thought, thought if this graph is literally too busy. With the title, it helped a little bit, you know, the title usually can tell audience uh, what this graph is about. However, if we look at the graph, actually, there are lots of different focus there, lots of different information. So all the audience members, uh, participants, when they look at this, all of them felt very struggling. They don't know what the graph is going to tell them, want to convey to them. So this is an example that, you know, for very complicated graph, actually, is very easy to lose the audience. Okay, so um, I just want to summarize here. So therefore, there are a number of influencing factors I can, I can, you know, uh, I can um, have, um, uh, I can, can, can find from this study. The first is uh, time poverty and attention scarcity. Because in this data uh, digital um, environment, our attention actually has been fragmented by lots of different tasks. And we, our attention itself is quite scarce, and so it, uh, it uh, really just makes the situation worse. And the time poverty won't help her at all. And the second, second problem is about the using of the small screens. 
So the devices, what kind of devices audience members they use uh, that, that do does influence you know, how they perceive data visualizations, how detailed they would like to look at. So if most of them using mobile, they wouldn't really like to look at a very complicated one, let alone data, um, data, um, data sets. You know, I ask them, do you look at the data sets? They would say, you know, if I use a computer, if I do have time, I would love to look at. However, most of the time I use mobile. I can't, I want to use my mobile to access data sets that will test my eye. That's what they you know, would say. And the third influencing factor is the importance of demographic backgrounds. In this study, uh, male and female does not really make any difference here. Most important thing is about the job, you know, what kind of job they do and their education. So um, that will link to the level of data literacy because uh, uh, those people who are close to data who have a higher literacy, would have a higher literacy level, that will make them become more critical of the data visual, uh, visualization. And the personal interest also could influence, you know, what they want to look at it and what they can get from the data visualizations. So i just quickly summarize here. So a um, suggestion for implication for data journalism practices is, I would say, the first, first of all, is the simpler the better. So a simple but a creative, um, very, with a very clear meaning, data visualization will, will, will work very well in this uh, you know, in this, uh, in the whole environment, uh, especially audience, uh, they suffer from time poverty, uh, attention scarcity, and use the mobile to access the news. Uh, the news, and the second is uh, definitely do need to provide reliable data sources. Although not all audience members would like to check, really check the data, you know, on the data sources. However, what they told me is uh, when I saw it there, I feel it is reliable. Especially if the data visual, uh, data sources are reliable, and they you know, often see that they know what that is, they would this psychologically they feel it is safe. You know, it is reliable. And the third thing is, uh, do need to provide the context for data, because uh, data cannot be properly interpreted without the context. So, do data justice. We need to provide the context for the data. For those audience participants who have a higher level of data literacy, without data sources, without context, they would question the reliability of data visualization. However, for those audience members who have a relatively lower data literacy, providing context will help them to properly understand the data, especially we discussed the meaning of you know, data might be different in different con contexts. So either way, you know, Providing context will be important for them to perceive uh, the data visualization. And the last point I want to make is uh, it will be important to make the meaning of the data visualization explicit. Even if you want to produce exploratory data visualization that can give audience the liberty to explore, but some sufficient, you know, essential explanation will be necessary there. Otherwise, the audience the members, they will just get lost. So I would uh, just uh, like to stop here and uh, so next step. So if you have any questions or feedback, please do you know feel free to ask me because today I want to go to detail. So if you wanted to know any more you know details about the findings, please do feel free to contact me. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so my colleagues are Jason Martin from DePaul University and Jared Lanoska from Indiana University. So we've been um, involved in this uh, kind of multi-country and multi-method um, uh, kind of project, larger project that tries to understand uh, different aspects of working uh, data journalism across different um, environments. And this particular paper that I am about to present today focuses specifically on um, engagement journalism, kind of forms of engagement uh, journalism, the data journalism, journalists, how do they conceptualize and think about it or what kind of uh, audience engagement they perform in their work. Um, and it is based on uh, in-depth interviews with data journalists across uh, three, four countries. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna just give the technicians a minute. Sorry about this, <laughs> this is a different, uh, to how I come up with the... 
Great. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, sorry. okay just go on, please. Um, so again, uh, here the main question was, uh, we're trying to understand how data journalists um, perform engagement. And we asked this question, right? Kind of a general question. What do you think about audience engagement? And at the same time, we're trying to understand what is the motivation behind that? And how, what kind of, kind of uh, what, what type of, of, of engagement can we uh, think about in terms of instrumental um, as ways to other ends versus more substantive, where they are thinking about uh, audiences themselves rather than some other aspects. Um, so our uh, theoretical framework, I'm going to just qu uh, quickly go through this, but basically if you think about uh, literature and data journalism has thought about um, two different aspects. There are two different, I guess, ways to think about uh, data journalism and their professional orientations. Uh, the first one, and here within the literature, mainly in the United States, but started kind of uh, in the early um, uh, 70s and 80s. Um, uh, there's this kind of attitude that uh, data journalism is as a means to reinforce the traditional values of journalism. And here we are talking about the application of the object a norm of objectivity um, as a way to kind of, uh, so the main drive is objectivity, but also investigative, and they've been associating data journalism with investigative <laughs> journalism uh, forums and, and, and the watchdog roles. However, the literature more recently has tried to understand data journalism from a different perspective and emphasize this audience turn in journalism at large, but especially in data journalism and has conceptualized data journalism as a way um, where this audience turn uh, in journalism is mostly manifested. So there, this is where this kind of project comes in to try to understand this audience turn in journalism from the data journalist perspective. So we are guided by this framework, and I'm sure lots of people in this room are very much uh, familiar with this, but basically uh, literature and data journalism that looks at this from two perspectives um, or um, defines engagement um, from the production-oriented side of engagements, encapsulated from this is Ramita's uh, model um, from access or observation, basically at the very initial phases of, of, of story idea and, and help get the audience's um, interventions to get the idea for the stories, but also data generated as well. Now we have selection, filtering, and then of course processing and editing, which are again all related to this production or in the pre-publication phase in a news production. Then of course we have um, uh, then we have the reception oriented engagement that talk about this post production or back end engagement and these two different forms of engagement really relate to how audiences are conceptualized at large and in the first aspect we have audiences that are conceptualized as active users and engagement is really thought about uh, the way to include um, audiences in the news making process. Uh, in the other perspective, we have uh, this kind of conceptualization of, of, of audiences as reactive consumers. And basically within this framework, um, audiences are considered or engagement is considered as a way um, towards other goals, achieving other goals in journalism at large. Um, as well, in this particular study, we are guided by this uh, framework of the audience logic. And we adopt this to the data journalism um, sort of field. And basically, there are three ways or three sub-logics to, to kind of think about uh, audiences within this framework. The first one is this normative sub-logic, where audiences are um, conceptualized as citizens within this kind of framework of, of broader institutional frames. Um, and here, the, the role, the way that journalists are through their roles is as um, advancing public interest, or so acting on behavior of, of the audiences. So that's kind of how audiences are, are um, uh, proceed. And there's this kind of paternalistic attitude towards the audiences. We are here to act on your behavior. And within this framework, we kind of, um, I guess, conceptualize or uh, predict that engagements will be mostly uh, towards reception uh, oriented types of engagement. That's where we're going to see it within this framework. Then, of course, we have um, the, the other sub logic that talks about more this kind of market sub logics, where audiences are conceptualized as consumers. And the goal here is to attract the largest uh, amount of audiences, rather. That's kind of the, the goal here. And again, with this uh, framework, we're gonna ex we could expect uh, more engagement at this reception, I guess, um, oriented engagement forms. Um, and then, of course, the third um, sub-logic, it's uh, here uh, borrowing by uh, Klingler and Svensson, is this net network media sub-logic. Within this framework, there's this kind of conceptualization of technologies as empowering the audiences, and this kind of idea that it's very much um, 
impossible to ignore what audiences want and how audiences can impact the work uh, journalists do. So basically with this framework, audiences are uh, conceptualized as empowered with these new technologies, but at the same time, there's kind of a bit of a tug and, and, and then pull within, uh, you know, journalists and audiences in terms of what's newsworthy, right? But, um, and uh, to some degree, we can, we can expect some bottom-up approach in terms of news production. And within that, this approach, again, uh, uh, we predict that we might see both of these happening, right? Uh, equal focus on production and reception area of engagement. Um, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, this, uh, the data I'm going to be presenting here today is very much preliminary. Uh, we are still analyzing. We just did the first coding of the data. We are still like we're going to do triple code and all of that stuff in the process, but um, so um, just like from our preliminary data, but it's coming from interviews that we did with journalists from uh, 36, uh, 34, actually it was 36 countries, but uh, anyhow, uh, this is 34 in, in countries. And uh, we are trying to uh, identify a sample. This is a purposive sampling. We're interested in data drills who are very impactful in their communities. So uh, well-known, most active in their communities, but also award-winning journals, because our attitude is that these are the people who set standards within community, basically. Everybody looks up to, to the big names that we have even here in this room, right? To what they are doing, let's just replicate that. So that's where we came up with our sample. We were also interested in uh, some kind of representation across different environments in terms of journalistic cultures, but also environments in data, uh, uh, data transparency and, and democratic, democratic and economical uh, environment. I want to emphasize that our data set here is limited to only English speaking data journalists, and that's a huge limitation because me and my co-authors were not able to uh, speak I speak a couple of other languages, but um, English sort of, uh, that's kind of how we limited uh, our, our, our sample. We started collecting data uh, with a pilot study at the Gen Summit um, in June of 2000, and then of course at the JHPC conference in September of 2019, COVID happened, um, and then the rest of the data were actually collected uh, via Zoom and Telegram uh, between July of 2020 and January 2021. So basically most of what, what we're gonna be talking about uh, uh, the, the perspectives that journalists were telling us was from this COVID um, impacted, I guess, environment. <laughs> uh, so there is a very brief, very hard to read table. <laughs> I still need to work in this table, make it more digestible, but just give you a bit of a country that are in, uh, represented in our data. <clears throat> and uh, so results. Uh, one more, please. Uh, so basically, uh, this is just a bit of a visualization of a summary of, uh, so we are trying from our interviews to come up with some sort of a typology. What, what types of uh, engagement, audience engagements are mostly prominent among this group of, of, of journalists that we interviewed? And we came up with this kind of um, four um, dimensional typology of how do they conceptually think about engagement. That goes from the crowdsourcing, the traditional way of, of kind of engagement, right? Um, and that interactivity was in included within this kind of aspect of, of, of engagement. Of course, social media engagement, the press production, and then another important thing that emerged from our data is this data transparency, engagement through data transparency. And I would like to spend some time on each of these categories to kind of elaborate a bit more. Um, so the first one, data crowdsourcing, um, relates to this production-oriented um, engagement. And uh, three sub things kind of uh, came up in terms of how uh, crowdsourcing is engaged in, in, in uh, I guess, adopted with this engagement movement. There's uh, crowdsourcing of story ideas. Uh, some data journals were talking about talking to their audiences about stories they want their community wants to hear about. Uh, most of it happened around this area, actually, information data gallery, uh, the ones who were actually engaging in this. And then uh, some talked about uh, data fest and hackathons as ways to uh, crowdsource actually the selection and filtering stage of the data production. Here are some examples of, of types of stories that were uh, emphasized by our, our, our interviewees. But I want to emphasize one thing. This was not very common. Crowdsourcing, and actually one third of our uh, respondents said, I have never done this. But another one third said, oh yeah, I've done it once. Let me tell you about this one story I did. And only five of our interviewees said, yeah, we do this actually regularly. So this is not very prominent. Um, and then when we ask about why do you do it? What are the benefits? Uh, as you can see here, 
these are some of the most pronounced. Oh, it's efficient to actually not uh, for, for, for uh, knowledge uh, as a knowledge search method, um, and if we can process data very efficiently, right? Uh, and uh, another important aspect about this group was, oh, it's very important for trust building and community building around these kind of stories that are important to our, to our um, uh, audiences. Um, of course, diversity of voices and giving voice to the people, a couple mentioned that, but not a prominent feature within this uh, uh, piece. Um, I guess one one uh, one uh, kind of uh, uh, one of the quotes from one of the people we interviewed. A very good reason to crowdsource data, I think, is if it has a local, spatial, urban aspect to it, and people know what's going on in their community. So this efficiency kind of emphasized. Um, the other type of, um, I guess, uh, is that the other category that we emphasize in our data is this visualization interactivity, which kind of relates to the process in editing, which has tra traditionally been conceptualized as a pre-production. Uh, However, in this particular field of data journalism, it's kind of a post-production engagement. That's how we think about it. Um, but again, lots of our, our respondents, about three-thirds said the visualization is important. It's a way to actually get, but then why, when we ask why, they said, well, it gives depth and length to our audience uh, engagement. So kind of very instrumental, right? It's not about, very little of it actually was emphasized, oh, because audiences can customize data. That was not like a prominent feature why they do it. It's because it gets that it's shared. Those, there, those stories got shared a lot. So that's why we do it kind of. But there was a, kind of what Jitsan was saying earlier, there was this kind of conceptualization or perception that audiences lack time and interest. Why do? But that's a lot of time for us to do this. And very few of them actually will, will get engaged that. And here's a quote from that. There was this idea that if you put it all information out there, people will want to explore it. And that turned out to be false. People don't want to do it, the work of being informed, shown to that. So I was very pleased to hear your, your, your story that kind of really validates this in a kind of a larger scale, I guess, in terms of, of, of how they conceptualize uh, or think about interactivity. Uh, then social media engagement, very straightforward. Yes, we really, uh, it gives life to our story behind publication. So we need to do that more. And actually there was this quote of this data drones from Minnesota. It's, like, it's important, although I didn't necessarily understand this importance years ago. Now, you know, they're starting to understand, well, we need to do more of this post because that's how the story gets life. Um, because of course, what's the point if nobody reads it? And that's where the audience are on social media. So that's why they put a lot of effort into that. Uh, of course, uh, they talked about receiving some feedback was important as you know, in social media, but it was more of a one way kind of feedback, not, not much talk about the two way feedback uh, within this kind of framework. So, uh, and the last, uh, and the last, and this was, I think for me, at least from my point of view, the most important finding of the study is this data transparency and how data drones are thinking about data data transparency as a way of engagement, right? But the way they think about engagement is not necessarily within audiences only, right? Actually, lots of people were talking about, um, yeah, in terms of audiences, it's good if we publish our data, and lots of them said we do this, publish their sources, uh, put that, that in a repository somewhere so that people can access our code, our, all of that, right? That was important to all of our respondents. When we ask why is this important, uh, it increases our credibility, accountability, and it demystifies the reporting process. This is why they're doing it, because it's bringing them closer again to the audiences. But then when you ask, how about when you share your data and uh, the code and all, it's like, oh, audiences don't care about that. None of them will, will use it. Although they were thinking about it as, as kind of actionable data still. That's still important because, yeah, our audiences will not go and get our code and our raw data to do, you know, explore it themselves. They don't have the time or the patience, but other stakeholders in our communities will do this, right? So we're thinking about this as actionable data, the way to engage our communities, not only the audiences, but the other stakeholders. And I think this was really very in, in, important and, and interesting. Oops, one more minute. Okay, so just to, yep, wrap up. So again, just kind of take away uh, um, or uh, uh, take away sort of a message here. 
Yes, most of the participatory features in our data journalism sample really relate to this uh, post-production engagement and data transparency as actionable data kind of really was an important feature here across our data. So this, I think, needs more uh, um, conceptualization and work with that. But as you saw there from our data, most of this is it's conceptualized as means to an end. Getting closer to the community, getting our community, uh, you know, our uh, sorry audiences, getting them to read, share our news. Basically, thinking more about the long term longevity of, of, of our um, of, of the story. Um, and again, oh, um, in terms of this kind of audience logic, if you think about our the way our data kind of can, can fall within, and this is uh, we are still working with this literature a little bit in terms of trying to nest our data within this kind of organization. But from where we are right now, what, what it seems is most of what our, these sample of journals are telling us falls in this kind of um, normative audience logic. Yes, there is a turn, audience turn in data journalism, but it's still within this normative perspective, right? Very kind of top-down um, way of thinking about engagement. Uh, also, there was some focus on this actionable data where our, our community and other stakeholders, civil society especially, can reuse our data, repurpose it, and things like that. But again, some uh, adoption of this network media logic, so they're kind of at the, at the intersection there because they cannot avoid it anymore. Uh, the new technologies have made it so that uh, we need to kind of, I guess, use them to engage our audiences, but mostly for this kind of instrumental really reasons rather than diversifying the voices or giving voice to the people, which is the way how traditional engagement or um, I guess uh, has been kind of conceptualized in traditional ways. I'm going to stop here again, and I'm sorry for going over, but thank you so much. And I really want some feedback because we're still working with this, uh, and I appreciate it very much. And here are some information. If you would like to get in touch with me and my team, I would be, you know, very happy to share more with you. Thank you again. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. So I'm presenting here a study that I conduct with Maria Gerg from South Denmark University, and I about the credibility, objectivity, and transparency, the audience expectation when they did data journalism publish misleading information. This study is about uh, this is a case study about a Brazilian newspaper that was very, very critical in this uh, sense because the data that they use and this we have all the background here that we're gonna explain to you. So we know that data journalism is, pro, uh, is we use like data source, so it means documents, studs, public data sets. However, this is like human made product. Uh, as we were discussing here, there is no raw data and the data can be used with misleading intentions or even uh, if it is not well analyzed, we can not use that properly. So it's hard to access the quality and the credibility of a database, and mainly because we don't know how this data was collected, how this data was reported. And official news sources are rarely checked because we tend to trust on this, you know, the data uh, that come from the government or statisticians institutions. And then we have here an issue that we have like an uh, environment that we have high choice media, uh, what means that is a lot of information and then people have this on their social media, and then people are not really well, uh, how can I say, cannot understand well what is trustful information or something that they cannot trust. And then we have this term of misinformation, disinformation. And also this is not clear for people. And then when you look to other contexts and then we speak Spanish and speak Portuguese, people use only one uh, way to express that, that is disinformation or disinformation. That means almost the same in our language, but not necessary. And then we have this misinformation can be sometimes non-intentional journalism either. And why is information has intention? And as we cannot measure or cannot see the intention in the information that we have in the online environment, it's hard to track that. And then we have a specific context of Brazil. We know that we have a really unique president and then he has denied the pandemic. He has said that we're like, it's just a zero flu. And he's jeopardized the social distance, the vaccination. 
And so he has been accused of producing fake news even for the media. And the vaccination is something that we didn't have an issue in Brazil. We are really pro-vaccination until uh, we had this president and then the groups were uh, like these anti-vax groups were emerging in, in our country. And then, so we had the vaccination start with the high risk groups and senior citizens because we didn't have vaccination in the country for everyone because he didn't buy. So who bought was a, a, governor, a governor from a state and then he bought and then this was the vaccine that we used for the whole population at the beginning. And that's also, when we talk about the data that was about COVID-19, was very problematic because we had, and I'm going to explain the next slide, uh, that the government was not centralized the collection of data. And then we have the data collect at the local and municipal level, then it goes to the state level. And then after that, we had the federal uh, government doing that, the, like somehow combine this data set. And then we have other organizations that were trying to collect this data from municipal and state level and putting that together. So basically, uh, so explain the work well here that we had in Brazil. So case and deaths were registered at the municipal level, the same for vaccines. And then the numbers were sent to the health bureau at the state level. And then Brazilian state communication, the, the numbers to the health minister. And then we have Bolsonaro and the government that were trying to postpone or putting a lot of issues to make this available. Other organizations from the civil society we're collecting this data with volunteers and making it available. This is another set that we're going to present in, in Korea this year. So the main problem is was delays in human efforts in resisting, resisting this process. Uh, then we come up with these two questions based one uh, after one news article that was published by Folia, one of the main newspapers that we have in Brazil. And they published a data, a story about uh, the you know, like expired vaccines that were uh, being distributed in Brazil, check if you are also in the list of these people. And then they use a data set that they got from the government website and they didn't check. And this data had a lot of issues and mainly, as I said, was main, main collected. So a lot of, you know, <laughs> if the system was not online, people were like taking notes in the paper and then put online that. And then there's another person who was responsible for this data online, so it's not necessarily the same data because could, they could understand the hand right. So we came up with two questions, uh, looking at three uh, news articles that were published, the one that uh, was using misleading data, the other one trying to correct that, and the other one trying to say sorry that we made a mistake. Uh, so here is the two research questions. What are the normative journalist values demanded by the audience in a case of an error? And how many posts could be found uh, in these values? And what are the audience perceptions about un unintentional e journalist errors or misleading information data? So as I said, so we have this main one that was saying, registers indicate that thousands of people got expert shots. See if you are one of them. And then people, it was, this was the article that was most read in the news uh, website since, you know, that they got online. So it was a lot of people, people really concerned about that. And then they had like another two stories about that. And then we collect the comments that people made in these two, three articles to understand their perceptions. We conduct, uh, we retrieve 160 one comment published by, it's uh, the good thing about uh, this new paper, newspapers, uh, this newspaper in specific, they, the people who can comment on their websites, only the ones who subscribe. So it's all subscribers. So we cannot get comments, you know, from the internet, bots or anything like that. So it's, or they were all subscribers. And then we removed from the data set like duplicated or comments that, you know, was something that we cannot compre comprehend. Uh, something like, you know, a lot of acronyms and things like that was really hard. So we use a math approach. So we can quantitative and, co and conduct also content, uh, content analysis of seven, six of these comments that we uh, validate and we understand that were uh, under our criteria. And then we use uh, three independent coders that would be our, we alter plus one research assistant. And then we our code book, we use these three um, journalist values, so the credibility. So we're trying to put in credibility all the comments that were accusing the paper of disseminating fake news, disinformation, 
uh, asking the subscription canceling because of that, and audience disappointment, uh, moral ethics issues regarding editorial and ad decisions, and also saying that one newspaper with more than 100 years of history could not do that, saying that the newspaper only had lies and sensationalism and all, all this type of criticism. And then objectivity, our comments are related to the method uh, or the lack of this verification. And also we had transparency. So I can acknowledge that they need to show our demand of, uh, for a retraction or trying to show clarity of the reason of the data and how they analyze the data. So we found that our comments were mostly about 50% about credibility. So our audience were, I mean, their audience, were asking about what is uh, the, the newspaper really need to be credible, what they are doing, they need to check their service, they need to work and call the Ministry of Health if they see outlines, you know, and trying to understand what is happening with the data, and they didn't. And then the other ones, it was about objectivity, what are the, and transparency were the others that we could see, but this, the, this strong one. And objectivity was really important because they said that the journalism that Folia was doing was biased and was not uh, professional and things like that. And asking transparency to have the data set, to have the information, how they pursued, how they did that. And then asking the other questions. So we're trying to somehow analyze these uh, comments and see what are the, you know, they are asking for. For example, here, it took a long time to see this retraction here because they took like about like five to seven, to seven days to say that was a mistake. And this generated a lot of, you know, noise on the social media and then people really worried about that. That's the reason the news article was the most read because it was for one, lead, uh, one week, it was a long tail, you know, like in, in the social media. And this is an example of fake news where people who want to equate folia with a f any fake news website. So people are saying that this was a, people were using this, this URL to show that, oh, the traditional media also lies, you know. And a lot of comments expre expressing this concern. And then people who have subscribed uh, folia for her life and saying that this mistake, it's really narrow mind uh, ways of risk retraction disappoint me deeply. Congratulations to on the nicest service in favor of this information. So they're saying that it's really, really uh, helping this disinformation environment uh, that we have uh, on the social media. And then the, the last one, the, that's why traditional journalism is dying. Where are the checking agents? Because they didn't say fact, -check, fact checking agents. We already know they are really far. And then also people commenting that it's not the fact checking agents were not like uh, somehow debunking or checking the traditional media. They are always tracking people that are, um, you know, politicians or people um, that are posting these things on social media. So our takeaway was that correcting mistakes quickly seem to be the paramount for the audience. So the audience requires that or they understand. So it's necessary that this could be done in a really short time. The audience demanded that journalists verify their search and make them available. So the transparency was really important. And communicating the limitations and uncertainty about the data was also something that very important because if they are not sure that this data has these limitations, why you should report on that? And if you should report on that, you should like highlight that. So this data was collected, but we didn't have any confirmation from the government or how this was collected. We know that there's a lot of systems in different cities, and this has to be, you know, somehow compile this data and then make it available. The, the audience doesn't seem to difference what is fake news, you know, disinformation, misinformation, or a generous error. So they are trying and they put all in the same basket. And that's always the reason that people are somehow uh, misjudging what happened. And also requiring this, the of the fact checking agents somehow how they are you know like checking other organizations but not really checking traditional media and that's all thank you and my co-author will be here for the questions online yeah